So our next presenter is Dr. Raul Lopez. He's the director of the Texas A&M Institute of Renewable Natural Resources, where he helps to provide leadership in the fields of wildlife ecology, military lands, and natural resource management. He works with stakeholders to develop priorities for research and extension programs to address high priority conservation and natural resource issues. He's also uh, the author of what we call the Texas Land Trends Project, which he'll discuss in detail here in a moment, that tracks the trends uh, of farms and ranches in the state, Texas, and maintains an appointment as professor in the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries Sciences at Texas A&M University. And he offices in San Antonio. So with that, Dr. Lopez. I'm going to tell you two things. One, things you already know if you drive across the state. And then two, some of the challenges that we find in our state with regards to our farms, ranches, and family forests. And I'm going to do it through the lens of the Academy Award winning film, The Good, the Bad, and the, and the Ugly. Maybe it didn't win an Academy Award, but, but I believe it should have. And so. We'll assume that and go to the next slide. So as Norm referenced, I'm going to draw on two uh, data sets. The first is called Texas Land Trends, and it draws on Ag Census data as well as uh, Comptroller data, and it marries those two data sets. Dr. Neil Wilkins was uh, the architect of the initial project, and through that unique mar marriage, it basically gives us a perspective in terms of changes in land value, land ownership, and land use. And again, the focus of that is farms, ranches, and family forests, so lands that fall under 1D, 1D1. The other data set that I'm going to draw on is a more recent data set. We recently conducted a Texas landowner survey. We surveyed uh, 3,100 Texas landowners, and through that process, began to understand, hopefully, a little bit of information in terms of what drives Texas landowners, these stewards, these caretakers of these uh, very important lands in our state. And so, again, telling this story uh, through, through those lenses. So let's start with uh, the first. Our state's a large state, 171 million acres. 95% of our state is privately owned. 83% of our state is a farm, a ranch, a family forest, 142 million acres. And those working lands are really important in a lot of different ways. It serves, in essence, to support the 26 plus million people in our state. And looking at that map, you see about 86% of Texans live in an urban center, a Dallas-Fort Worth or Houston, rather. About 10% of Texans live in rural communities, so very small percentage, and less than 1% of Texans own 142 million acres collectively, 83% of these rural lands. So that, that's a very important subset in terms of stewards for these broad natural resources. And looking at this notion of changes in people, looking at our land trends data, in 1997 there were 19 million people in our state. We currently estimate 26 million plus people in our state. We're adding about a half a million people to our roster each and every year. Two-thirds of those increases are occurring in those top 10 counties, Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, San Antonio, uh, the Valley, and El Paso. Looking ahead, you know, again, we're blessed in our state because we have a strong economy. That's what's drawing people to our state. And in looking at the future projections, the most uh, likely estimates project the population will grow from 40 to nearly double, 55 million people in the next several decades. If you thought traffic was bad now, getting here to the summit, it's going to get worse. There's shifts in, in Texans, this shift between rural Texans and urban Texans. About 86%, as I mentioned before, of uh, Texans live in, in urban centers. So there's, there's a disconnect, if you will, from these farms and ranches and family forests. And so more people, more pressure on our natural resources means less farms and ranches. Wah, wah, wah. That's why I feel like I'm Debbie Downer. So we'll try to kind of tease through those, those challenges and start to look at some opportunities. 
In the last 15 years, and looking at the land trends data, we've lost a little over 1.2 million acres of working lands in our state. And a driver to that is market value. You know, the average market or average value of ag lands in our state have in, has increased about $1,000 per acre. The hotter the color on that map, the higher the value. So in some places, we're seeing four, five, six thousand dollars $6,000 plus per acre in terms of value. And so that's a, an early predictor of fragmentation and ultimately conversion. This is a map that shows fragmentation. In the last 15 or so years, we've seen 25,000 new farms and ranches due to fragmentation. So new operators. And the darker the color there shows where much of that fragmentation is occurring. And no surprise, it's close to and it's tied to those urban centers. So I said, I warned you, nothing I'm telling you is surprising, but you start to see these patterns and hopefully things start to make a little more sense. The last piece, and it's not the ugly, the, the notion of landowners are, are beautiful people, but, but the, the challenges in terms of changes and perspectives, and I, I'd like to kind of go through that as well. So the average farmer in our country is 57 years old. The average forest landowner is 65 years old. And in the next 20 years, our country, our state, is going to see the largest intergenerational transfer and land tenure. That's worthy to say over. In the next 20 years, we're going to see the largest exchange in private lands, in farms and ranches and family forests our country, our state has ever seen. And we're seeing it now. So looking at land trends data as an example, in 1997 versus 2012, the hotter the color, red, just to give you a perspective, is is over 65 years of age, you start, we're seeing an aging Texas landowner. The, the absentee, uh, lighter the color means the proportion between absentee and resident is, is skewed toward absentee. So that means these are folks that live in the cities. So as you would expect, uh, lighter or absentee ownership is greater in and around these uh, cities. And the last slide I'll show in terms of absentee landowners is how far do these absentee landowners travel from these, in this case, three urban centers. You see uh, Houston, San Antonio, uh, Dallas. They're all going to the hill country, if you haven't figured that out, <laughs> uh, or West Texas. And so again, it, it starts to give us a little bit of a perspective in terms of uh, goals and objectives for our landowners. So here's the question. What's that future landowner going to look like? The, you know, a younger generation, uh, perhaps not as tied to the land. Are their goals and objectives the same? Do they have the same concerns? New ownership is about 25%. That means uh, they've owned the property, in some cases, for less than 10 years. Absentee ownership in our state is about 40%. The task given by Ms. Fitzsimmons to me was comparing millennials to older landowners. And so I'd like to kind of go through that with the, my remaining time and, and kind of show you some of the similarities and also some of the differences. The graph to the far right is basically a histogram of landowner demographics or responses from the survey. And what that means is when you look at that, most of the landowners are older than the 50 to 65 year age class. So in order to do the comparison that uh, Blair asked me to do, uh, I had to look at information to the uh, left of that red line, and there's not a lot of responses because there's just not, a, most of the landowners don't fit that category, right? And so I standardized the graphs that I'm about to show you, looking at it by percent so you can compare apple to apple. So I'm going to go through a, s a series of questions. And, and again, give us uh, some insight, hopefully. The first uh, set of questions are, are why? Why do you own land? And so this question from our survey, the comparing millennials, which are in blue, versus uh, older landowners, asks the question, why do you own land? And at the very bottom, it gives you in rank order the reasons for owning land. The top reasons 
include hunting, wildlife, family, recreation, and ranching. Not a lot of difference between the younger generation and the, we'll call it the, the, the established generation. The next uh, question was, what recreational activities do you enjoy on your property? Some differences for, for some of the categories, but generally hunting, wildlife, experiencing nature, ranching, fishing. What's interesting here for millennials, uh, target practice is actually number three, so it kind of shifts over. So they're armed, just so you know. <laughs> Next slide. What species? It's obvious, and going back to the other questions, that, that there's a, a, a strong focus in managing for wildlife, or wildlife is a, is a main interest for Texas landowners. And so these questions start to drill down a little further, asking the question, you know, what's your, your driver, goals, and objectives specific to, to wildlife management? So this question is species you manage on your land, game bird and upland game bird, migratory game. <laughs> Uh, are in the top three. Uh, not a lot of difference between millennials and, and other. I don't have this slide here. We, one of the questions asked within the big game group, what's, what's your <laughs> preferred species? And white-tailed deer is 86%. So white-tailed deer is king in Texas uh, from a Texas landowner perspective. This map from our land trends data shows the changes in wildlife valuation and enrollment over the last 15 plus years. The program was established in 95, and so you could see that this is on the, on the beginning of it with the Ag Census, and we've had a gain of a, a little over three million acres, and the darker the color on that map is where you have the greatest proportion of enrollment. So you start to get a sense of, of uh, differences in, in uh, drivers, goals, and objectives for landowners. All right, the next set of questions are going to shift and going to talk about money. And so the first question is, how much of your annual household income comes from your property? Not much difference between millennials and the establishment. But what's interesting is about 80% of landowners uh, report that less than 25% of their annual income is derived from their property. One of the things that I think is important to, to note is many may walk away from that thinking, well, then that means they're not making a living on, on that property. Their contribution from that property is really important. They may have another uh, occupation that complements that. To, so don't want to diminish the value of, from an economic perspective of the, some of these lands. When we start looking at absentee versus resident, you start to see some, some differences there. And, and here's a comparison. So same question, how much of your annual income, uh, household income, comes from your property? This is between absentee landowners, which are in blue now, as well as resident. So as you would expect, absentee landowners have a higher response percent count compared to resident. So, so again, there's, and that flips when you look at uh, you know, one, one to 25%. So folks that live on the farm and ranch are, are making a living of some sort, or at least supplementing their income from, those, from that farm or ranch. Slightly different question. This question asks, what are the sources of income from your property? Ranching is, is the number one response. Uh, no income uh, is, is in there. Hunting, oil and gas, farming, etc. Not much difference uh, between millennials and other. Same question, but now it's comparing absentee versus resident. For ranching, you see resident uh, landowners have a higher response rate in terms of uh, reporting an income compared to absentee. And uh, it flip-flops in the no income category. So again, sometimes feel bad that they pay me to tell you the obvious, but if you drive around Texas, you probably know a lot of this. But it's always good to start to see numbers to understand what those trends are over time. All right, now we're going to go into the what questions. What are you going to do with your property? At the bottom, it goes from not at all likely to the far left to very likely. So to translate it to the far left, hell no, to yeah, maybe so. 
So the question here is, how likely are you to sell, sell your land? And it's hell no uh, is, is the, the number one or the greatest response. So landowners are, are, are vested. They're interested in keeping their properties moving forward. What's interesting is when you ask a slightly different question between millennials and, and the establishment is how likely are you to transfer your land to a family or a loved one? And so you start seeing a separation where for the establishment, they're looking at transferring that farm ranch to the younger generation, hence the reason why we're here. For the millennials, less than 40 years of age, they're not thinking that. They're hoping to enjoy it for a couple more years. What struck me about this question was, and we asked 32 different questions, but this question asked, what are some concerns? What are some things on your mind? And in looking at the bars, again, you know the colors. Uh, absentee or Millennials are in blue. Uh, green is uh, the establishment. When you look at wildlife, disease, uh, wildlife and livestock diseases, endangered species, landowner liability, soil health, and so forth, generally the, the takeaway from this set of slides is established landowners, older landowners, uh, have greater concern compared to millennials. And so there may be different reasons for that, but, but this was uh, one of the takeaways here. This was alluded to in the keynote. The question here is, what's your willingness to participate in cost share programs, market-based incentives? From the, the survey, millennial landowners are more open to those type of programs and so forth than the established type of landowner. And so there's an opportunity. So it's not all doom and gloom. There's, there's some opportunities here as, as well. This set of questions are the where questions. So. As a landowner, where do you go for information? Sources of reliable information for private land needs? Not a lot of difference, but uh, in looking at the, the, the top sources, TPWD, the internet, ag extension, local resources, et cetera, are some of the, the primary sources for, for information for landowners. This question is, how do you prefer to receive information? How do you prefer to receive information? Email, in-person, internet, or formats, if you will, that landowners prefer. Some of the things that surprised me are like with webinars, uh, was a fairly low format for, for landowners. They, they we were about to embark on, on some webinars or webinars uh, within the institute, and, and that's something that landowners, for probably a variety of reasons, don't really care for. So email blasts, and, and a good example of, of that is uh, Caesar Clayburg uh, Institute, Wildlife Research Institute's uh, white-tailed deer email blast is, is a format that landowners seem to like. Whether you're a millennial or, or an established landowner or an absentee or a resident landowner, they, they still like that face-to-face -face type of uh, format. So whether it be on a weekend or, or maybe a something within a city, the landowners really like that. And so this actually is my last slide. So to sort of sum up the, the current state, if you will, the, the charge that, that was given to me was to talk about changes in, in uh, people. And the takeaways there is, is we have a shifting Texas population going from rural to urban. We've got shifts in ethnicity within uh, within those populations, we're going to have more people with a finite set of resources. And so this collectively is, uh, uh, offers us a set of challenges in moving forward. Um, this impacts our farms, our ranches, our family forests, whether through conversion or fragmentation. And so Trying to address that, um, changes in perspectives. You know, we've, we've got uh, a, a lot of similarities in, in Texas landowners, whether you're, you're older or younger, whether you live on the place or not, we've got some differences. And, and the opportunity, I think, there is, is learning how to reach those landowners in different formats and programs and so forth to ultimately uh, endorse, advocate, support, encourage their continued stewardship.
of, their, of those lands. Our country, our state, is going to see the largest transfer in land tenure. And, and this should be a real concern for all of us. And I think that's why we're here, that's why we're having this summit, is, is what is the, the steps in ensuring that the next generation not only captures the torch, but carries the torch moving forward. And the last bullet there in my mind is something that, that I strongly believe in because I think that's uh, the, the key to all of this is, is really communicating the public benefits of private lands. What happens on a farm or ranch 100 miles outside of San Antonio, I live in San Antonio, benefits me when I turn on that, that tap. And so how can I, as a resident of this state, serve to continue to endorse and support the, uh, the sustainment, the sustainability, the conservation of those private lands in some form or fashion? And, and I've said this before uh, to, to various folks, I think the messaging to that has to connect and resonate with those urban populations. That's what I like about the, the no land, no water type of uh, campaign. It's not about, uh, well, this is about uh, family history and so forth. That's important, but that may not resonate with 86% of Texans. But when I start talking and saying that water that you depend on, that clean air, those recreational opportunities, those wide open places in the state, and there's a lot of wide open places in, in the state. Uh, we've done the reversed land trends analysis. So if you're interested in building a bunker and, and getting off the grid, I'll tell you the county to go to. You can talk to me afterwards. But I, I believe that's part of the, the overall strategy and messaging and moving forward. Questions? Yes, ma'am. What was your sample size of uh, renters? 3,100. Oh, the, uh, there were Texas landowners. And, yes, so through uh, various partners in this group, uh, I serve on the uh, TPWD Private Lands Advisory Committee. And so through the plaque and through groups like TWA, Cattle Raisers, Farm Bureau, we basically distributed a, a web-based uh, questionnaire and, and just trying to have a, a, a sense of where we are. And so one of the things that people oftentimes ask is, well, do you have enough of a sample size and things of that sort? And, and there's some, uh, some biases in, in the results, but we wanted to have an answer of some sort just to start the conversation. And the, the other aspect to that survey is being able to time it with the Ag Census Survey. So the Ag Census Survey is, is currently being done. It's done every five years. And so we were hoping to have a data point uh, now, so in five years we could perhaps repeat that survey or questionnaire and start to have a better sense of some of the changes or trends from a landowner perspective. Uh, one of the things that, that's missing in the ag census data is, is the landowner component. They'll ask you, you know, how old you are, how much you make, uh, or how big your property is, things of that sort, but they don't really drill down into what drives you. What are your concerns? What keeps you up at night? Uh, things of that sort. And uh, the other aspect, you saw those uh, spider graphs, I call them. Uh, being able to uh, link where you live and where you farm or ranch for the first time and then being able to, to do some comparisons that we haven't been able to do in the past. So we're just starting to scratch the surface in terms of analyzing that data, but looking at regional differences and things of that sort. Um, That, that's, a, that, that's a great question, yes. There, there was two questions, one of which says, uh, where do you, where's your largest farm or ranch, and do you have multiple farms and ranches? So we were able to, to uh, tease that out. But the focus, again, for simplicity, was, was the larger property. And, and we did that, and that was a, we had to do that just to keep the survey short. So keeping our, our social demographers at bay at, uh, was, was my, my task. And, they wanted to ask 200 questions. I said, landowner's not gonna answer that, but uh, we wanted to keep it short and sweet. Ruthie. You know how 
Texans are very paranoia about anyone telling them what to do or how to manage. And I feel like maybe m would wonder the percent of these landowners that participated in the survey, those type of landowners that participate are probably the type of landowners that are going to reach out for help. So you don't know what percent that we really need to get to that mm -hmm. care about stewardship and getting scientific based help and best management practices and for their watersheds and all that kind of stuff. Uh, a great point, and uh, and again, we certainly recognize the, the limitations of the of the questionnaire survey. Uh, case in point, uh, there's an underrepresentation in the Panhandle, um, Permian Basin area. I can tell you that right now, and and so again, uh, we, we were we, it started out within the plaque as a as a effort to try to fill in some gaps in, in guiding what we do as a group. But through that, and, and you know this, you're, you're a part of all that, um, we, we developed the survey to just, again, get a better sense of, of, uh, of some key issues and so forth. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a starting point. It's not uh, by, by any means the, the, the end, but uh, it certainly gives us some, some insight and a step in, the, in that direction.